twice, Dan Bellum has had two books published in one year. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, his, his own poems, Counting, and the Central American Book of the Dead by Balam Rodrigo. He did it once before in 19, uh, pardon me, yeah, in 1999. Uh, Dan lives in Berkeley, California. He's the author of five books of his own poems. Their titles are One Hand on the Wheel, uh, which launched the California Poetry Series, Buried Treasure from Cleveland State Poetry Center, uh, which was the winner of the Alice, Alice Fay de, Ca de Castagnola uh, Award for Poetry uh, for, from the Poetry Society of America, and also the uh, uh, Cleveland State University Poetry Center Prize. Uh, in uh, 2008, he had his book Practice published, uh, and then um, uh, in 2017, Deep Well. He's also a prolific translator of Spanish poetry and French poetry, uh, modernist and, and uh, contemporary. Uh, his his uh, translated titles uh, include The Central American uh, Book of the Dead by Balam Rodrigo, which I mentioned already, uh, published by Flower Song Press this year. Uh, Speaking in Song by Pura Lopez uh, Colomé, uh, from Shearsman's books, and Song of the Dead by Pierre Reverdy uh, from, from Black Square Editions. That was completed with support of an artist's fellowship in translation from the National Endowment for the Arts. He taught literary translation and poetry uh, uh, in, the F, in the MFA uh, uh, and creative writing program at Antioch College in Los Angeles. Uh, and he's also taught at Mills College and at New York University. He serves as an interpreter for immigrants and asylum seekers in the Centro Legal de la Raza uh, in Oakland, California. He has a website uh, where you can learn much more about him. Uh, and it's, a very, it's very easy to remember. It's simply www.danbellum.com. Uh, about the recent book of his own poems, Counting, uh, 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 let me say a couple of words about that. Uh, a, a circle of rabbis in Talmudic times con confesses, confesses to each other ruefully, uh, quote, I've never in my life prayed with intention. I've been counting chickens. I've been uh, counting the layers of stone in the wall. Close, close quote. These poems on seeking and straying uh, on a seeking and straying spiritual quest of, of their own, they count and recount the layers of days in a life, ranging from widely, uh, uh, ranging widely from yearning to elegy and political outrage to passion, devotion, and gratitude. Um, I, I, I've read a number of his poems, and I think that that uh, he counts the rhythm very well, just as a a, a good instrumental musician uh, needs to count in order to render the full musical effect of the instrument. Um, and um, uh, so, I, and when he reads, I I have a I have a a, a favorite poem, uh, and uh, uh, I hope that he, maybe he'll read that. Uh, it's called election elegy. So uh, um, let's uh, let's welcome Dan Bellum. Thank you, thank you so much, Ed and uh, Lisa and Dave, uh, for organizing us, and thanks for everyone uh, joining from Ann Arbor and from all over the country and and the world. So I'm I'm glad you're here. As, as I was saying to people when I first got on, I lived a couple of years in Ann Arbor way back when, got my master's degree, but, you know, in case the University of Michigan is wondering if my dissertation is ever going to arrive, you can tell them, no, it's not happening. So I think they know. Anyway, so yes, I'm gonna read poems from Counting and, um, and I'm gonna read a few pieces from the, from the new translation from Central American Book of the Dead, but, 
I often like to uh, start readings uh, with a poem by somebody else. Just cause, you know, it's not all about me or any one of us, we're part of a community. And this is a, a poem I just encountered by a poet I love. And so I'm just kind of bending everyone's ear with it this week. And uh, so this is by a, a fine um, New York poet named Gregory Pardlow, and it's called Wishing Well. Outside the Met, a man walks up, sun tweaking the brim sticker on his starter cap, and he says, pardon me, old school. He says, you know, is this a wishing well? Yes, son, I say sideways over my shrug, throw your bread in the water. I tighten my chest, wheezy as Rockaway beach sand with a pull of faux smoke from my e-cig to cozy the truculence I hotbox alone. And I am at the museum because it is not a bar. Because he appears not to have changed them in days, I eye the heel chewed hems of his pants and think probably he will ask me for 50 cents any minute now, wait for it. A smoke or something. Central Park displays the frisking transparency of autumn, tracing paper sky, leaves like eraser crumbs gum the pavement. As if deciphering celestial script, I squint and purse off toward the roof line of the museum, aloof as he fists two pennies from his pockets, mumbling and then aloud, my man, he says, hey, my man, I'm going to make a wish for you too. I'm laughing now. So what, do you want me to sign a waiver? He laughs along, ain't say all that, he says, but you do have to hold my hand and close your eyes. I make a starless night of my face before he asks, are you ready? Yeah, dog, I'm ready, sure. Sure, let's do this. His rough hand in mine inflates like a blood pressure cuff and I squeeze back as if we are about to step together from the sill of all resentment and timeless toward the dream source of unneeding, the two of us hurdle, sharing the cosmic breast of plenitude when I hear the coins blink against the surface and I cough up daylight like I've just been dragged ashore. See now, you'll never walk alone, he jokes and is about to hand me back to the day he found me in like I was a rubber duck. And he says, you got to let go. But I feel bottomless and I know he means well, though I don't believe. And I feel myself shaking my head no when he means let go his hand. That's Gregory Pardlow. And I just love the surprises and encounters that poems give us so. There you go, check him out. And uh, I think I'll start with a kind of New York poem of my own. This is for my husband. And in our early days, we lived briefly in New York. And uh, invented a ritual. This is called Kissing on Bridges. There are 36 bridges in Central Park, no two of them alike, or rather there are 14 bridges and 22 arches, some ornamental, some rustic. We set ourselves the goal in our early days of kissing each other on every one of them. And why wouldn't we? Then somehow we lost count or lost our way and then we left or fled that city, but there were quite a few fashioned in one case of sandstone and brownstone with ornate carvings in its spandrels. There was a little explanatory pamphlet or with Gothic style catrefoils on its balustrades or featuring a red brick vault above a bridle path or with cast iron railings and blue gray granite along the abutments and one with a pair of decorative grottos and an arch face surrounded by pentagonal voussoirs. One even made of boulders held together by gravity alone, one lower than the terrain around it and almost out of view, and some no more than humble, nameless, wooden pedestrian tracks, all available for kissing, even requiring it. 
whose idea it was first we'll never remember, never know. Each time a moment of decision, a crossing over worthy of our pausing to consider, will we cross together? Do you love me still? If you have walked on ahead, will you wait for me? 40 years on, never mind if anyone is watching, at every span over every stream or riverbed, drought racked or full, every chasm, gulch, canyon, crevasse or minor depression in the earth, in all manners of principalities and states, we neither fail nor forget, we allow in our generosity every specimen and instance, nor do we leave a trace of having passed this way. We look into each other's eyes and take a breath. We kiss on bridges, no two of them alike. Try it. You know. <clears throat> Maybe it'll become a craze. Okay, here's, here's a... Um, Here's a pantoum, if you know that form. If you don't, don't worry about it. But it involves repeating lines, which is perfect for obsession. Um, Don will remember this one. It's called In Rome. <clears throat> Surrounded by the unattainable, I at last want nothing, or almost nothing. I become contented with the fleeting, the perishable, Last night I wanted nothing but a rose pink shirt and tie in the window at Missoni. Contented with the fleeting, the perishable, I ate a double cup of plum red gelato. But I wanted the rose pink shirt and tie in the window with a pink moto helmet to match. I bought a cup, double cup of plum red gelato, three euros instead of 500. No plum red moto helmet to match and a notebook with a map of Rome on the cover, three euros instead of 500. But didn't I deserve the Dolce & Gabbana boots? A notebook with a map of Rome on the cover, the Tiber like a ribbon marking my place. But didn't I deserve the D&G blue leather boots that came with their own blue swimsuit, briefcase and hat? The Tiber like a ribbon marking our place. We strolled down a lane of prohibitive antiquities. I forgot the swimsuit, the briefcase, and the hat. Now I pined for an astrolabe, an Etruscan chariot. We strolled down the lane like prohibited antiquities in a realm of the sun-blessed and the young. I pined for an astrolabe, a globe, a chariot. I longed for unapproachable Roman men in their realm of the sun-blessed and the young, when what I wanted was a youth I never had. Those unapproachable, godlike Roman men, transfixed by wanting nothing but themselves. What I wanted was the youth I never had, or almost never. No, I became transfixed by wanting nothing, wanting not even that, surrounded by the unattainable. And while we're still traveling, here's a sonnet. Um, and it's called The Spirits. Uh, there's a few drinking toasts in here in Irish, Hebrew and English. So they might be familiar to you. The Spirits. In the Dublin airport, in the duty-free shop, a brand of Irish whiskey. Writer's tears. So many by now, I haven't had to weep and swallow, swallow and weep. And still one hears the spirits calling. And can you not a wee drop take of it, lad? Sladsha, l'chaim, cheers. But sod off, will yous. You know I know how deep one drop would get. Next, it's a couple of beers, then Guinness is good for me, and no, why stop it there until it's another 100 years of Irish fucking solitude? I keep on moving, duty freed. It disappears more swiftly now, the phantom thirst. My head is cleared for takeoff with the tears unshed.
And uh, here's one I call it, this one is from just before the pandemic. It's called Days of 2019 or News from In Here. Uh, about a strictly fictional character, of course, uh, named Dan. <clears throat> Days of 2019. Dan, born Daniel, is mostly content with being one of the minor prophets. Dan is like tidewater, generally, sailing slowly straight in and under the bridge and past it and then back out at appointed times in a faithful motion with little room for doubting. Dan does not pray, but he places himself in places where praying takes place, and he sometimes says the words, and he thinks about when he might begin. As Dan understands it, today's lesson is one of humility, same as yesterday's lesson. It has to do with asking, and the answer could be no. Dan washes the dishes, wipes down the countertops, folds the laundry and makes the bed. And this is to stave off chaos and possibly death. On a recent night, Dan was stretched way past his spirit border. The cord yanked nearly to where it could snap. Dan worries about not having enough words. Dan would like to call easefully down to his dead, one ear to the dust, that they could come out now because it's safe. But what if they called in an opposite way up to him? At the gym, Dan is interested in the young dreadlock trainer with a generous smile and the man always reading novels in Spanish on the stationary bike. But mostly he keeps to himself and mildly resents the other exercising people who may after all be embodying a fear or two in his heart, the out of shape and the old. Dan overhears two teenagers on the number 18 bus. Girl is like, wait, you're Jewish? Boy is like, dude, are you fucking with me? I'm hella Jewish. Dan's bar mitzvah portion was the voice coming out of a burning bush. And like Moses, he is hesitant about revelation. Dan can often be found in the early morning in a storefront or a basement in a meeting, but it's anonymous there and no more can be said about it. Dan has a man who unaccountably loves him. At his work, Dan is a fortunate one who's never had to cross a border on the run or half drowning or with copters whirring over his head. Fortunate to be only language enacting a crossing one to another and back, making it carry like water and silt in cupped hands, not any truth of his own, but what a person has said to plead his case, to help him stay. Dan is younger from happiness than he used to be. Where did Dan learn to read so much? Beside a great river, at a high school in the Midwest that closed down later and became a minimum security prison. Dan read a phrase in a book this morning, sexual terror and joy. Yes, that's what he would like. An electrified flaring along the entire body, say, or the mind, or what's the difference? and with a particular other person, and not so much of this porn on the internet instead, not really. At odd times, Dan lays his bones down on the yoga mat and lets them crack. And after a while, so far, he stands up. When Dan sees that there are no more pages for writing in his book, he is disinclined to make a parable of it, and he opens another. All right, here's a pandemic poem. Again, for my husband, but um, maybe some of you have learned this skill too, out of necessity. It's called haircut. You sit shrouded on the kitchen chair, a bed sheet clipped at your neck, your head in my hands, boy in a barber shop. And what will we have today, young man? And ap the apparition of someone's dad, yours or mine, silently supervising from 60 odd years ago. And where do I, who should be an expert at this by now, begin? 
but with a kiss on the crown of your head. And here goes your quarantine buzz cut, the only style I half know, as with a flick of the electric clipper, I soothe and carve away what dusty gray locks we've been growing together until they got unruly. And I go unevenly, I know, missing spots and passing over them again, like second thoughts, like plaintive amends and tender around your ears, filling in the moments with gossip and weather, though nothing is new, and making you at last more or less as smooth at the skull all over as when you entered the world. Because who else will do it, alone as we are, with this hair that will keep growing in the grave a while, how long, unshorn at the last, where I kiss your head again to say I'm done. If you need a buzz cut, I'm your man, but it's the only thing I know how to do. So look out. <clears throat> okay, this one is called um, Spring Vista after Du Fu. Um, du Fu, you may know, was a Tang Dynasty poet in eighth century China. And um, one of his famous poems begins to the effect. Uh, the nation is ruined, or the country has collapsed, or something to that effect. The nation is ruined, but mountains and rivers remain. So anyway, there was a government shutdown. I thought of that poem. After Du Fu, Spring Vista. February spring. The government is shut down, but the mountains and rivers remain warming too soon after the three month spire like songbirds nesting in the next door full green tree about to depart. Here I am, a low official in an outer district, hair going white as new blossoms, taking count of the migrants coming in between sections of the uncompleted wall like letters from home, pleading asylum from our war. And I interpret for the guardians of law what they have to say. All right, and here it is from November 2016. Um, it's called Election Elegy. Uh, for extra credit, um, there'll, there'll be some references to the, the home state I grew up in because this is addressed to my uh, father. Um, you can guess what state I'm referring to and put it in the chat. <clears throat> Election Elegy, November 2016. It's all one sentence, I think. It's kind of a rant. Well, you know, we were ranting then and maybe still are. You and mom canceled each other out for decades, I'm sure of it, and somehow it worked, but anyway, the ballot was secret is all you would say, and you did your share of railing at any politician in spitting distance, white man of the working class with no college education, except for maybe when we got a Catholic in there, and who wouldn't be angry in a state where the governor routinely went to jail and one is still there where he belongs, not to mention I formed a good part in the end of what you were angry about, me with my books and my ticket out of town on a scholarship, and how I came back, as you'd say, with ideas in my head, or as you liked a self-made man who'd worked it, worked for it like a grunt and could put his name on things, but a guy who just sat at a desk and thought thoughts, what was that? And same went for any billionaire who got it handed to him or a big shot who talks out his ass what he'll do for you tomorrow. No, a shyster you had no time for, never mind the sucker who'd fall for him and get what he deserves. I'm just saying, don't we agree at last? Though you've been too dead now to vote for 22 years, even in a state where the dead used to vote all the time. And I don't want to hear for one more fucking minute I should try to understand the angry white man because I do, and he's my kin, and I'm one myself, and I'm not having it because neither would you. And just look at him, dad with his money and the snarl on his face and his suits that don't fit right and his orange hair. So there you are. Yes, when I wrote this, former Governor Rod Blagojevich was still in jail, but guess who pardoned him and set him free? 
I will say no more. All right. And dead um, vote in Illinois. <laughs> there you go. Yes. <laughs> Well, they used to. His machine made sure of it in Cook County, Chicago. So, all right. And now we jump forward in time, though not all. Well, no. I'm going to jump backward a bit. Um, this is set at um, in New York uh, during the height of the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement, which turned out to be. Um, camped out right across the street from where I used to be uh, a temp secretary on Wall Street, God help me. And so um, it brought me back to those days, but I was, I was struck by um, a sign a young man was holding up at the Occupy Wall Street encampment. So it's, uh, it's an unrhymed sonnet, it's called Clear Enough. We're here, we're unclear, get used to it, reads the young man's handmade sign at the edge of Occupy Wall Street where the gawkers pass and the shadows of the unindicted in banks of offices fall and scriveners cross to work, preferring not to, including me, oh, 30 years ago, a temporary kind of person up there on the 15th floor just his age, I'd guess. He stands in a little unbeautiful square they call Liberty Place. I escape to on lunch break, inwardly screaming, hungry, because a person gets hungry in the cold with only a sign. He stands above the camouflaged money green of the tents and shelters by the one bedraggled tree that grew unplanted out of rubble, like the recurring desire to overturn a prevalent system of thought. And wouldn't you, is it not perfectly clear enough? So, uh, so here's a, a pandemic uh, Berkeley poem. <clears throat> and it's called Alleluia. Since yesterday, somebody spray painted the future sucks on the bus shelter outside the coffee shop, but with a stencil, meaning they planned it out in advance. A woman sits by the door with a cup, maybe all her possessions in three plastic bags and a sign. This isn't how I expected to spend my 60s. My heart hurts. The motherfuckers are letting the criminal president go free. And the man pushing his cart up Shattuck keeps shouting, Alleluia, when the word comes over him, a falling sound, more distress than joy. Do other hearts half stop? I don't mean the unlocatable soul where morality might lie in its unmade bed or beauty or choice. I mean my heart. A um, couple more from this book and then I'll turn to the translation. Yeah. Here's a little parenthood poem. I'm happy to say everyone survived this period. Although my dear friend, Hannah Bloch, who's no longer with us, used to joke, the first 40 years of parenthood are the hardest. Anyway, this one is called Song, Running Away. <clears throat> when he was three, he said, tearful and sweet, that he would run away from home, but for the dread of having all on his own to cross the street. When he was four and a sophisticate, by then no mere beginner, at leaving. Casually, he asked one evening, would it be okay if he ran away right after dinner? Practical fellow. He packed his little lamb and dog for his head one pillow, a toy telephone, and set off alone. Where did he imagine he was going? No way of knowing. 
Every few weeks, months, years since then, he runs away again, so far without consequence. Gets halfway down the block or around one corner and relents. 18 now, hand on the door, operatically heart sore, far bolder at bitching, at overreaching, heavy pack at one shoulder. Where he's bound or when or whether he'll come back, he still can't say. I've stopped beseeching and started itching to let him run away. All right, one more from counting before. Um, we hear some translations. Uh, so this is a, I read a lot of fiction, but I have no idea how it's done. And yet, I wrote this kind of little short story that I tucked in the book. It's a page and a half long. I was so proud of myself. Like, wow. Anyway, I was, um, uh, my husband, Yoel, and I were really fortunate and blessed to get to know uh, the wonderful writer, Grace Paley, a bit in the last 10 years of her life. And this is a story that Grace kind of told on herself in some, this is a, a version of that. And as far as we know, never wrote it down. Um, and if you know her stories, if you don't, you must. So find Grace Paley's stories. But um, she had a kind of an alter ego recurring character named Faith. So um, this is what I wrote, half written a faith story for Grace Paley. She woke up to a clinking sound like a stuck thought as if there were some pestering obstacle in a story she wasn't writing that would work itself out in her sleep if she could pay attention enough. Foolish thought that it would happen like that, but it wasn't a thought, thought faith, it was a dream and a dream is not foolish. Not a bone in her body that was moving, but the eyes wake up in a hurry if they need to it was her ring of house keys dangling over her face and attached to the keys, an unwashed hand coming out of the sleeve of an unwashed shirt and attached to both of these in the half dark, a young man standing at the side of her bed she had never laid eyes on in her life. Why wasn't she more afraid? She knew what had happened, she had done it again. Richard was always warning her or Tonto, Ma, you can't leave your keys in the door like that. What are you thinking of bringing in the shopping? or distracted at the mail as the door shuts behind. You're on West 10th Street in New York. This is not some anarchist Russia of your dreams. Your mind is elsewhere. She often liked her mind being elsewhere, but at the moment it was locked onto the peculiar here and now and what it might want from her. So she sat up, the keys almost brushing her face and then tugged out of reach. He had mostly a look of reproach at her foolishness on his face, too nervous to manage sarcasm or menace or any of the more criminal expressions. And he held up a not very serious knife. He wanted her money, but it came out like the kind of pleading she used to get out of either of the boys when they came up short on a Saturday night. The hand with the keys was shaking more than dangling. It wasn't so much the loss of her sleep that made her weary, it was the sadness of that hand. He didn't smell so good. He looked 18 or so. But I don't have money, Faith told him. I'm a school teacher. What's the matter with you? Do you live around here? Yeah, he answered on, hey, I bet you got money someplace. Coming into her house at an hour like this with an inadequate weapon like the idiot and a folk tale, it made her wonder about the kid's mother if he had one of those. In the end, she found six dollars or so in change while looking into all the desk drawers in among the scraps of paper she had written things down on for untold years to think about some more someday when she had a little time. Quite a few scraps that ought to be poems by now or maybe were already, and here was another half-written story standing upright in her bedroom uninvited. Now she would have to run into him at odd times around the neighborhood forever like an unfinished argument. She would have to choose to wonder or not how he was making his way. 
getting out her door, he turned around, remembering his manners, and handed back the ring of keys. This probably can't go on, you know, Faith said. You could put your mind to something else if you wanted. Have you thought about the community college? Then she sat up for the rest of the end of that night, putting her mind to one of the vagrant scraps of old writing she had found. So that was Grace Paley. Before he was out the door, she really was suggesting community college. There you go. Um, I'm gonna read you some of this uh, amazing book that I had the honor to translate. I met Balam Rodrigo, a poet from Chiapas, Mexico at the Guadalajara Book Four Fair five years ago. And these poems just completely spoke to me and I just thought instantly, I've, I've got to work with this. Um, as uh, Ed mentioned earlier, um, I do, um, I volunteer as an interpreter with, with uh, migrants and people seeking asylum from Central America. So um, this is this stuff is close to my heart. This, this book is in multiple voices, um, uh, living and dead, uh, people crossing through Mexico on the way north um, from Central America. And, um, and it's not for the faint of heart. Um, there's some pretty grueling stories. And yet I swear to you, uh, this is not a book of exaggeration or high drama for its sake, for its own sake. Um, anyway, I will read you, um, I will read you four of these. And um, it comes out in May in a couple of weeks. So, um, uh, and before we go, I'll, I'll put, um, you know, book info in the chat. So this one is, and many of the poems, especially if they're spoken by the dead, uh, are titled by um, the coordinates and the location where a, a body might be found. So this is in the voice of an 11 year old boy and with the latitude and longitude, Tonala Chiapas. Oh, and there's, there's various soccer references, um, which I'm not expert on, but also uh, you'll hear references throughout the book to the beast or la bestia in Spanish. It's the, it's the network of, of freight trains that, um, that migrants ride on um, uh, by the hundreds of thousands every year, often because they have no uh, alternative. And it's a horribly dangerous way to travel. Um, people uh, are maimed or die and, um, or are um, abducted by um, gangs or, and, and extorted for money. Anyway, Tonala Chiapas. I'm 11 years old, now and forever. I was born in Barrio Fendesal in Soyapango, not far from San Salvador, but for me, Nobody ever was my savior. My father got killed by pandilleros from MS-13. They stole a soda and a quarter off him. That was all he had. He made $3 a day at the garbage dump. I helped him out pulling the cart. And sometimes we found food in the trash bags that came from Metro Centro and went home happy. I ran away from Soyapango with Pablo, who's 15, my friend from the street. He wanted to be a futbolista like me and play for the Selecta. We'd go to the majors and try our luck. That's why we were aiming to get to the United States where they have more dollars than gangs. At a Mexican sandwich stand in Cuatepeque, Guatemala, I saw an awesome show on TV about El Magico Gonzalez playing for the best Cadiz club in history. He scored two goals off Barcelona the year my father was born, 1984. I was so happy I cried two days to reach the Mexican border. We crossed the river and hopped onto the beast, just past Tecunuman and Ciudad Hidalgo. Before we reached Arriaga, I fell asleep. 
and I'm still falling. Forever, just like El Mahico, I'll wear an 11 tattooed on my back, maybe for how many bags they put my torn up body in, maybe because I was wearing the Selecta shirt with that very number, or maybe because death's got that endless 11 of train tracks carved on its gut. Before I fell, Pablo told me this dream. I saw Roque Dalton rising up among the living to come back to the land of the dead. At his right hand side, El Magico was dribbling up on death, kicking the heads of Salvador and Pandilleros and doing that snake move, the culebrita macheteada, knocking a tremendous nutmeg between death's legs. Flor Blanca Stadium was packed. The crowd was holding a gigantic wake for all the migrants who were dead. I know that God plays football up in heaven, but I don't want to be on his team just yet. I'll stay right here on the bench, waiting for my friend Pablo and El Magico Gonzalez to call me with a smile to play a match. Oh, let's see. Um, this one's in a woman's voice, and um, it's the latitude and longitude, and it's titled uh, by the location Francisco y Madero, Coahuila, a city in northern Mexico. The heavens massacred the light. It lies unraveled, shredded, dismembered against the sky, decapitated fossil stars. That's how we are, scattered in the desert, our clothing tossed among the shrubs and thorns, faded, shapeless flowers. The elements eat away at what's left of us. Our prayers are distant and in vain. They abducted us in broad daylight from the bus station in Torreon, Coahuila, gangs of young killers, savages with AK-47s, their violence numbed over with white powder, men with the routine of butchery in their blood. Planks of wood for the men, sticks for the women, hard blows and pain. They pulled numbers out of us along with teeth to extort our kinfolk thousands of miles away, far beyond our ruin. Dry pasture, airless sun, black vultures circling watchfully over our heads. Abandoned, huddled together in incandescent cold, we died of pain, of thirst, sometimes of hunger, and we remain here with our hands and feet bound, our jaws taped shut, tongues rolled back like a dried up snake. Above us, the drawn and quartered light and its corpse, burial mounds of spinning stars. In the mountains of Santa Rosa de Copan, Honduras, my country, the orchids are in bloom. Here in this ditch, swarms of flies swell over my raw blue flesh, the sky forever is black. Um, here's one that presented a particular uh, translation challenge. Um, practically every verb in this poem, it's called the, the migrant's prayer. Oración del Migrante. Practically every verb in this poem is a form of, of the Spanish verb levantar, which can mean to raise or lift something up, to get up in the morning, to, uh, but also in um, police and news jargon, it's a euphemism for abduction, kidnapping, disappearing people. Um, and English doesn't have one word that does all that. So I had to come up with something else. Um, maybe I'll read just a few, the first few lines of it in Spanish and you'll hear a bit of that and then I'll, and then I'll read my translation. Oración del Migrante. No quiero levantarme, padre. No me levantes. Madre, prefiero caer, prefiero caer 
en los filosos y amorosos brazos de la bestia. Nadie quiere ser levantado, madre. Nadie quiere ser levantado, padre. Me levantabas para ir al colegio, padre. Me levantabas para ir a jugar, madre. Etc., etc. So, now in English. Migrant's prayer. I don't want to get up, father. I don't want you to wake me up, mother. I'd rather fall, I'd rather fall into the loving, knife-sharp arms of the beast. No one wants to be grabbed up, father. No one wants to be rounded up, mother. I used to get myself up for school, father. I used to get myself up to go play, mother. The caress of your hands would raise me up from sleep, mother. Your words would lift me up from the table, father. I would lift my face up to the sun. Once we were up, we'd go to the cornfield, the woods, the pasture for that season of the year. But here in Tenosique, Father, others have lifted me, Mother, with humiliation and torture, with rape and with slaughter. They came for me earlier and later than you ever did, Mother, and for forever, Father. I don't want them to pick me up. I don't want to stand up ever again. Let no one rouse me forevermore. The sheets that cover my face are not white, but stained with blood. Now take up my body on a stretcher to Honduras. Take up my body and my tears in a coffin. Take up my black bones and bury them in Tegus. I don't want them to return and snatch me up, Father. I don't want them to come back and carry me off, Mother. I don't want to be spirited away. Tell them I'm not here. Never wake me, Father. Never wake me up, Mother. Um, I'll read one more from this book, and uh, it's actually about people still living. So there's that. Uh, but this is a tribute to a group of women in Veracruz um, called La Paz. La Las Patronas, or the patrons, or even the patron saints. Uh, and since the mid 90s, and they won a national human rights award for this, which is one of the things the poem is commemorating. Since the mid 90s, they've been, you know, um, by the train tracks, uh, uh, giving free food and drink to migrants traveling north um, with no outside support, no nada just doing it because it's the right thing to do. So this is called the patron saints. Storm in La Patrona, Amatlan, Veracruz, a night lit by oil lamps, the sun gone down, the electric light gone out, rain beating its fury against the roof, sheets of water pounded to shrapnel clatter. Coffee made from tortillas burnt charcoal black and strained through a rag. Nothing but tortillas to ease hunger and beans boiled over the fire. The fire lights up faces, warms the shadows. The migrants shiver, cups in hand like little hearth fires of water, sugar candle lights for the journey. They barely speak, they stare at the ground, at its cracks and crevices, the ash of charred wood, a snow frost over their feet. The train shakes the earth as it passes and roars deep and kills the last of the sun. Two Nicaraguans widen their eyes like street cats. Tomorrow, we'll hop the beast tomorrow. Still, they stand up to go. And I think maybe rather than leave you there, I would read one last poem from Counting. If that's, I think we have a few minutes, is that okay? And um, it's the title poem. So this is, um, Ed made some reference to it in his introduction. I'm hearing a little echo back. Are you hearing that or is it just me? We're hearing it. Okay, I don't know what that's about. I don't know if it's strong. Okay, 
I don't know if it means that anyone, if anyone was unmuted. No, it uh, looks like not. Okay. Anyway, uh, so it's kind of a meditation on praying or not. And in the middle of it, there's this uh, story, a kind of a humorous, but of course, serious also story from the Talmud, the uh, rabbinic writings of Judaism. Um, and it's, I mentioned obsessive forms earlier. This is in syllabic lines counting from one to 36. So it's kind of a triangular shape as the lines get longer. Don't ask, it helped me write it. So, but you know, try it if you like playing with forms. It's called a ropalic. I learned this from Brenda Hillman. <clears throat> Counting. What if I, this moment were only prayer, not a thought or word of one, nor even an intention. Sunlight on grass, nothing of itself but what it shows, or a bird that is called out, filled with purest hearing. Well, I have the prayers in the book, and once again I have lost my place, dreaming even past the prayer that calls on me to listen up. Must I start it all over, and where would I begin? How far into the past would I unwind? How far would a self has have to cast itself out before it flew beyond its reaches? to live instead of being only lived in? Oh, it's like asking to stop breathing. In the time I've spent worrying, the sun turned all to shadow, it began to rain, the scent of the mown grass lifted into the trees, and now the light and shade have returned to their places a little further on in accordance with the number of moments that have passed. Rabbi Hiya, called the Great, once said, I have never in my life prayed with intention. One time I tried to intend, but only wondered in my heart whether I would be received before the king or sent into exile. How was I to know? This, of course, started the other rabbis talking. Rabbi Samuel admitted with a shrug, I have been counting chickens. Rabbi Bun, the son of Hiya, said, I have been counting the layers of stone in the wall, and his eyes lit up with this woeful confession. Rabbi Mataniah sighed, since there is always one who feels responsible for the prayers of all the rest, then let there be blessings on our heads, for I have noticed that whenever we come to the last of the benedictions at which we are commanded to bow down, our heads are bowed down of their own accord. But look, I must have nodded off again, enumerating losing track of what I meant to praise, drool on my shirt, or else have had a dream with none to interpret it. Will you not look away from me a while as Job cried out and let me be whilst I swallow my own spit? The rain has started falling again, even in the path of the sun, as if there's no reason to decide which will be first or last, and a great round of song is circling among the uppermost branches of the spruces. Return to me, O oh God, and I'll return, letting the day begin again, even if it's halfway gone, extolling the one who removes the sleep from my eyes, the slumber from my eyelids, and gives the rooster discernment to tell day from night. Let me count the threads of you that I might tug at, complicated by being many, simple by being one, and if not to arrive at wanting nothing, which is another desire, then to yearn for what is given, including the dust and the ash, and the last moment you have counted up for me, wherefore I clap my hand unto my mouth. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. That was fine.